Chapter 20 is setting the stage for the Civil War, uh, the early actions in the Civil War, and how the North and the South were divided between 1861 to 1865. So to begin, we know that Abraham Lincoln's uh, election in 1860 marked the end of the Union, that the South decided to secede from the Union as a result of a Republican being elected president. During his lame duck period, in office, or the, his lame duck period before Buchanan left office, Lincoln could do nothing. But finally, on March 4th, 1861, uh, Lincoln was officially sworn into office, becoming the 16th President of the United States. In his inaugural address, his focus was completely on this secession issue. Um, first and foremost, he said, this is only going to be a conflict if the South starts it. He has to be very conscious of uh, how he is perceived by moderates within the North uh, who might want to see a peaceful secession. Also within, within his inaugural address, he says, it's impossible for us to divide. There is nothing in the Constitution that... Uh, allows for secession to happen. And even if there was something, you know, where are the geographical boundaries to separate us? There's not a mountain range, not, there's not an ocean, there's not even a river that divides north versus south. How will we split the national debt? You know, the South can't just say we're leaving and just leave without uh, contributing their fair share to the national debt. What about these western territories? How would we even begin to divide these uh, western territories? And finally, Lincoln said in his inaugural address uh, that the United States needed to stay united. We had to be a united force against possible future European interference, that they could try to come in and break apart the Monroe Doctrine through a divide-and-conquer mentality, that we are better and stronger when we are united. But nonetheless, the South had decided to secede. Um, and as each of the states seceded from the Union, uh, they began capturing uh, federal forts, mints, arsenals, uh, whatever federal property was within their boundaries. Uh, one example of a fort that refused to surrender was Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. A hundred men, obviously loyal to the Union, were there at when South Carolina seceded from the Union. But they can't hold out for very much longer. They need food, they need supplies, or they're going to have no no choice but to be starved out and uh, surrender the fort to the Confederacy. Uh, Lincoln has to be very careful here. He can't appear as the aggressor in this situation. He has to appear as the one uh, that is being attacked. Uh, so he makes the announcement that the Union is going to send provisions, and once again these are provisions, food, supplies, things like that, not reinforcements uh, to these men so they don't starve to death and aren't required to give up the fort. Um, he does this to keep the moderates within the United States happy that he is not the one starting the Civil War. Uh, but nonetheless, this uh, uh, provisions that were sent to the Confeder into the Confederacy was seen as an aggressive act by the Confederacy, and specifically South Carolina. And so on April 12, 1861, they fired upon Fort Sumter. Uh, Fort Sumter was required to surrender. No lives were lost. Uh, but with the fall of Fort Sumter, these are the first official shots of the Civil War. And with this, uh, remember Fort Sumter becomes the rallying cry for the North, that the South are the ones as seen as the aggressors from a Northern perspective. And so with this, volunteers were called up, uh, and this allowed uh, Lincoln to begin this war without having to take the blame for starting this war uh, from a Northern perspective. Um, Lincoln used this to his advantage. 75,000 militiamen were called to volunteer. Uh, and with this, the South saw this as the U.S. Uh, waging war upon them, and so four more states then seceded from the Union, including Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Uh, and with the secession of Virginia, Richmond, Virginia was declared the new capital of the Confederacy, which is extremely important because of how extremely close it is to Washington, D.C. Here you see uh, an original photo of Fort Sumter in 1861. Uh, here it is today. Uh, here is its location guarding um, the bay into Charleston. 
Now let's talk about the border states. Crazy important. Uh, there are five states that remained with the Union that were slavery. These are the border states. Five slave states that remained with the Union. Uh, these include Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, Maryland, and the newly created state of West Virginia. Uh, in mid-1861, the western counties of Virginia decided to secede from Virginia. These are those mountain whites that we've talked about before in the mountains of Appalachia. Uh, that were none too keen about fighting a war to protect slavery when they didn't care about slavery anyway. So with this, we see the creation of a new state of West Virginia that stayed tied to the Union. Now, the fact that uh, the United States kept the border states is probably one of the single biggest advantages during the Civil War from a northern perspective. Um, had these states joined the Confederacy, they would have been half of the population of the Confederacy, and they would have doubled their manufacturing capabilities, which would have uh, really given them uh, more of an advantage, especially in this uh, industrial war that was being created. Also, by retaining control of these border states, uh, the Union also retained a strategic location, specifically keeping control of the Ohio River. The Ohio River obviously flows into uh, the Mississippi River, which gave the Union a way to get right into the heart of the uh, Confederacy during the war. It is a strategic uh, location. So Lincoln, who has to be very careful every single thing he does for fear that the border states might secede from the Union, uh, especially in the state of Maryland, uh, Lincoln decided to suspend habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is our civil law. Literally, it means release the body. Um, because when you are arrested under our civil government, you have uh, certain rights that are obliged to you, uh, a speedy trial, right to confront your accuser, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By suspending habeas corpus in the state of Maryland, he is suspending all of these rights that you have under the Constitution in uh, the state of Maryland. Um, martial law is the rule of thumb in Maryland, meaning whatever the military says, goes. Um, Anti-unionists were arrested and uh, retained during this war. Now, the reason that uh, Lincoln decided to suspend habeas corpus in the state of Maryland, um, there is a real fear that if Maryland were to secede from the Union, Washington, D.C. would be completely cut off from the North. Remember, Washington, D.C. had been carved out of Maryland and Virginia. Well, Virginia has already seceded. Um, and so had Maryland also seceded from the Union, Washington, D.C. would have been completely surrounded by hostile territory. So it was extremely important for Lincoln to maintain control of Maryland. Troops were also sent to Missouri and West Virginia in order to maintain control over these border states as well. Uh, here you see where each of the states are. The blue is obviously the free states, um, and then down in the south, the Confederacy, and then finally the green are the border states. Now, the division within the United States, um, beyond just dividing north versus south, this division uh, extends further into the territory, specifically uh, the Oklahoma Territory within Indian Territory. Um, the five civilized tribes, many of whom owned slaves themselves, uh, sided with the Confederacy in um, exchange for their uh, uh, siding with the Confederacy, uh, they were able to send delegates to the Confederate Congress, uh, and the, this Congress took over their uh, federal payments um, in, and kept them fed. Um, they also supplied troops to the Confederate Army. Uh, the Plains Indians and some of the Cherokees sided with the Union. Um, now, this war is considered brother against brother war. Uh, beyond just the fact that it's north versus south, in some cases, literally, some brothers were fighting on one side, some brothers were fighting on the other. In fact, Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, her brothers actually um, fought for the Confederacy, which is kind of awkward since her, father, or since her husband was the President of the United States. Um, beyond that, we see a crossing of boundary lines that some people from the Union went down to fight for the Confederacy uh, and vice versa. We see 50,000 Mountain Whites and 300,000 uh, 300, up from the South coming to join the Union cause. Uh, in the end, 600,000 would be dead, which is obviously our highest amount of casualties during the war, but any war, but considering everyone in this war was an American uh, helps to explain that. Now, some strengths and weaknesses on the part of the South. Uh, first and foremost, 
this one of the major advantages that the South had was that the North had to invade and conquer them. That this was going to take a massive amount of manpower to invade and conquer the South to literally force them kicking and screaming back into the Confederacy. Um, many Southerners also believed themselves to have the moral advantage because they believed in this right of self-determination. Uh, they had linked this idea to the revolutionary cause and so they were fighting with the same vigor that many of the revolutionary war veterans had fought as well during uh, the past generations. Um, the South, many historians believe, had superior officers like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Uh, in fact, Robert E. Lee had been offered the Northern Command uh, before Virginia seceded from the Union, but with his state, uh, Robert E. Lee also seceded. Uh, in fact, uh, Lincoln had to go through several, several, several officers before he was able to find U.S. Grant to help lead the Northern cause. Um, and from a Southern perspective, once again, in, in terms of just your basic uh, people in the Army, they were used to guns, they were used to horses, because that's the lifestyle in uh, Southern America at this time, working in the, on the farms, the plantations, uh, hunting, etc. Now, obviously there are disadvantages. Number one, which we've already talked about, is the lack of the border states. And with the lack of the border states, they also have a lack of factories. You know, we talked about this way back in, with the founding of Jamestown and the other southern uh, colonies back in 1607. They found, founded themselves as an agrarian society. The land was too valuable to build factories on because they could grow cash crops like tobacco and cotton and indigo and rice and things like that. Uh, so without these factories, this was going to have a big dis be a big disadvantage to the South because you need to build guns and um, ammunition and uh, have uh, uniforms sewn for the soldiers, etc. They just don't have that capability in the South. And even if they did have that capability in the South, the fact that their infrastructure uh, was essentially destroyed during the war also hurt their cause as well. As the Northern Army ma marched South, they destroyed railroad lines, roads, uh, fields, whatever it was, to bring the South to their knees. This was absolutely total war. And so with the breakdown of this infrastructure, specifically the railroads, um, even if there was food and clothing and uh, whatnot that was available to the soldiers and even civilians, it was difficult to get it to where the soldiers were at because they didn't have the capability of um, uh, getting it there. So those border states would have been very popular had they joined the South. Now from a Union perspective, their strengths were essentially obviously the South's uh, downfalls, more manufacturing, and not just a manufacturing class, but also agriculture as well. Remember the Midwest, that bread basket is growing all the wheat, the corn, um, etc. that the North is going to need to feed their soldiers during this war. Uh, they also obviously have a higher manufacturing class, as we've seen already created during uh, this time, which is only going to add to the Union's cause. Uh, they have more wealth. In fact, uh, they had the out of the United States, the North owned three-quarters of the wealth, three-quarters of the railroads in order to supply the troops and the civilians um, anything that they needed during this war. The strength of the Union Navy also played a large role in helping to bring down the South. Uh, specifically, <clears throat> they were able to control the seas. They were able to blockade the, the coast while at the same time continuing to trade with Europe themselves. Um, the fact that nobody came from Europe to help the South also added to uh, the South's downfall. Um, uh, the Union had a larger population, 22 million people in the North compared to 9 million people in the South. That doesn't include the 3.5 million slaves. Um, and during the war, more and more immigrants continued to come in, only adding to the possible um, supply of soldiers for this war. Um, and our, obviously the North's biggest strength was the border states. Retaining control of them really helped the Union win this war. And so with this, uh, Lincoln had to be extremely careful about how he presented this war to the people. This couldn't be seen as a war for abolition, at least in the beginning, because he had to retain these border states. He couldn't say we are fighting to end slavery everywhere, or else those border states would have seceded right then and there. He had to present it, at least in 1861, as a war to reunite the Union. That was the goal of Lincoln. Um, as time went on and as those border states became more and more secure, then talk of abolition and eventually emancipation could uh, come about. 
Uh, the North's obvious major weakness was a lack of quality officers. Like I said, Lincoln went through several officers or several uh, generals for the Army of the Potomac or uh, the Northern Army before he was able to find U.S. Grant. Uh, here you see some of the new technology during this war, obviously being uh, transported via the railroad. Uh, here you see General Custer, um, who eventually uh, uh, died at the uh, Battle of uh, Little Bighorn, which we'll talk about later on. But he obviously was um, trained at West Point, like most of the, the, the officers were at this time. Uh, here you see an ad appealing to the newly arrived immigrants, specifically from Italy, to come and join the cause. And we will talk about the rest in part two.